But tonight, we focus on yet another ugly piece of history that seems to be repeating itself once again. And it came to my intention last week when I watched this clip of Al Gore, which we will play here a little later on in the program. It's shocking, but only if you know history. And so that's what we're going to do. Tonight we'll focus on one unfortunate common thread shared throughout human history, and it is hate. And the attempt that hate eventually makes to wipe out massive sects of human population based on various forms of hate. Um, fear, ignorance, whatever it is. We have such a long history, and I, when I say we, I don't mean you and me per se. I don't mean the United States of America. I mean humans, and that's what it seems we forget over and over and over again, that it's, it's humans that have a hate problem. This, for instance, this is a document of real hate. This is, um, this is the document of the court proceedings, if you can call it that, of the Inquisition. This was for um, a man who uh, would not submit and uh, would would not declare that uh, uh, he was uh, on the church's side or the king's side, if you will. He eventually did, after they made this case against him, he immediately then did submit, and this guy was lucky enough to live. But that's the Inquisition. The Inquisition where um, if you were deemed a heretic, you would be burned to death or you would be tortured. Um, and that's just one episode. The punishments were, quote, for the public good in order that uh, others may be terrified and weaned away from the evils that they might commit. It's interesting to me that um, the church and state, when combined, would burn people to death um, for not paying attention to God. And then later, the church and government would burn people to death for wanting to pay attention to God. The government doesn't matter. See, it's not the same hatred over and over again. It's whatever gives people power. These people, um, this is actually an original William Tyndale Bible, um, and all he wanted to do was be able to read it in his own native tongue. And so the church and state burned him to death because it took away their power. They burned people to death in the Inquisition because if you didn't submit to them, it would take away their power. The same thing with the people with the KKK. It took away their power. This is actually, this is uh, just such a spooky thing, even on a stupid mannequin. This is actually um, a woman's um, KKK outfit from the 1920s. Uh, originally owned by, I don't know, somebody, some famous KKK woman. I don't know. I, d I didn't know any famous ones existed, but it's extremely disturbing because it was owned by a woman. When the women of a society go awry, you're in deep, deep trouble. The KKK thought that they were superior, but it really wasn't superior as much as it was about power and they tried to wipe those out that they believed were inferior but where did that come from that idea of superiority had to be carefully taught before the violence of the KKK because the KKK happened after the Civil War there came this and this is a a, a dog tag this was a tag had to be worn. This was uh, number 1041 from Charleston. And this is a dog tag that had to be worn by um, a slave. And they were not to be caught uh, without it around their neck like a dog. How do you get to the KKK where you really believe you're superior? We'll make people into dogs first. But before people were made into dogs, and it was only one race, it was, ra it was uh, raged on, on really anybody, not just race. It was anyone poor, regardless of their color. In fact, many of the slaves in the early American colonies were white. They were called indentured servants because 
you'd be expected to be free after you served your time. And that went for both blacks and whites. And between 1630 and 1670, while they were burning people at the stake for this, here in America, slavery of both black and white was commonplace. And freed whites and freed Africans, as they were known then, um, would contract their own slaves, both black and white. When African Anthony Johnson was freed in 1635, he received 250 acres of land and he became the master of both black and white slaves or indentured servants. He's actually most famous for being the first owner, if you will, of a state-recognized African-American slave. There were no cameras back there, but uh, back then, but do we have the picture? Have we already showed it to you? The picture of the, uh, of the owner, there he is. He's an African-American himself. You see, the, the idea is that hate knows no bounds, but it's always about power and control. All you have to do is believe that you are superior some way or another, race, intelligence. Progressive history t teaches us that our founders hated the Indians because they were all racist and they kicked the Indians off their land and stole it. Yet countless Native Americans fought alongside Washington during the Revolutionary War. The real hatred of the Native Americans didn't come until much, much later. It didn't come until Andrew Jackson really started to um, uh, make it just very popular. He decided that the Indians were evil, and he implemented the Indian removal policy, which amounted nothing less than an ethnic cleansing of the Native American. This is a book... Um, called A Century of Dishonor that um, came out. It's a very rare copy because no one wanted to read it. No American wanted to see it, but um, I'm preserving it, so at last, what, what happened? What happened to the people who wouldn't become Christians? What happened to the Christians who wouldn't sit down? What happened to the Native Americans that weren't good enough? What happened to the slaves? You see, Abraham Lincoln... When he wanted to free the slaves, he didn't argue that a man would be, um, uh, that a man who was black was um, superior. What he did was he argued that you have no right. This is his thesis. He says it's not about black and white, it can really be about anything. He said if A can prove that he may have the right to enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? This is his letter in his own handwriting. But the next paragraph goes on, but you mean that it's not color exactly? You mean that white are, whites are intellectually superior to blacks? Then why can't someone who is intellectually superior to you enslave you? You see, the argument falls apart and Abe Lincoln knew it. In the 1800s, we have Darwin, and after we freed the slaves, Darwin came about, and he took hatred into a whole new theory. He was only part of it. Darwin's theory of evolution was gaining popularity, and he warned of the consequences of failing to selectively breed. He said, and I quote, if the various checks do not prevent the reckless, the vicious, and otherwise inferior members of society from an increasing at a quicker rate than a better class of men, the nation will retrograde. As has occurred too often in the history of the world, we must remember that progress is no invariable rule. So in other words, you're not guaranteed to move forward. Well, now we're breeding people like dogs. And Darwin's theories influenced many, including a guy over in Germany named Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche's most famous for declaring the death of God and believing the world had to be freed from the evils of Judeo-Christian morality. But that would beg the question, of course, if it's not God's morality, then who, whose morality do we replace it with? He answered, quote, society, as a great trustee of life, a great trustee of life is responsible to life itself for every miscarried life. It also has to pay for such lives. Consequently, it ought to prevent them. In numerous cases, society ought to prevent uh, procreation. To this end, 
It may hold readiness without any regard to dissent or rank or spirit. He was saying here that you could restrain people in any way, even deprive them of their freedom in certain circumstances, even castrate them. Well, you take Darwin, you have to help the species along, otherwise we'll go awry, and then Nietzsche, there is no God, and we have to, even if we take them and deprive them of their liberty and freedom, we have to do that, because there is no God. This was the trouble that brewed in the 20th century, and it eventually led to the uh, promotion of something called eugenics, Greek meaning good birth. And from 1912 to 1932, three international eugenic congresses took place. This is an original copy of a book called Eugenics. It's absolutely horrifying. The purpose of eugenics and these congresses was to investigate how they could improve the hu human genetic makeup. Which country do you suppose was the first to undertake action? Of course, it's the progressive era. Under progressive president Teddy Roosevelt, he created the National Hereditary Commission, whose mission was to uh, encourage the increase of uh, families of good blood and discourage the vicious elements of the crossbred civilization. Oh. Sterilization laws cropped up. In fact, the first one was passed in Indiana in 1907, where you could just grab a woman or a girl and sterilize her. It's horrible, right? You wouldn't want just girls sterilized, right? Remember that for later in the show. Others followed. The betterment of the uh, race. Um, in Yale, they had, a, um, they had a race to get to a better race, if you will. Um, and the whole thing was to um, get other Americans um, from, their, from their homes and pull them out, deprive them of the ability to have children if they were, you know, stupid or deemed um, wasteful people, and lock them away in institutions. These actions were likely emboldened because of the academic elite were behind the idea. And so they just knew better, right? The greatest minds in America, Yale, arguing that our national vitality depended on a productive citizen. And the best way to ensure that, of course, was through carefully controlled breeding. Well, you can't, you can't pick who should marry who and who should have children with whom. You just had to weed out those who shouldn't be breeding with anyone. Yale Luminaries founded the, Better, the Race Betterment Society, among other eugenics propaganda outlets, and eugenics became mainstream in the scientific community. It was a big deal. I want to show you a bulletin board at Yale that should um, scare the dickens out of you. This is from uh, Yale in the early 20th century. It says here, these are three, these three little circles there, I don't know if you can make them out, are light bulbs. Um, the first light bulb says, this, flash, uh, this light flashes every 16 seconds. Every 16 seconds, a person is born in the United States. This light flashes every seven and a half minutes. Every seven and a half minutes, a high-grade person is born in the United States and will have the ability to do creative work to be fit for leadership. Only about 4% of all Americans come within this class. Then the top one says this light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as insane, the feeble-minded, criminals, and other defectives. Some people are born to be a burden on the rest. Important to remember the Yale Bulletin Board. This takes us to Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. She lamented the spread of human weeds, the undesirables, as she, according to Singer, said African Americans were. The full context of the human weeds quote should be seen. She said, Margaret Sanger, quote, colored people are like human weeds and are to be exterminated. The Sanger wanted the in, uh, to engineer people, and she engineered the Negro Project. She said of it, quote, 
We do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious neighbors. She was talking about the African-American minister that would play right into their hands, she felt. It should come as no surprise that Margaret Sanger supported the KKK. Yes, maybe she was one of the progressives that wore that outfit behind me. Always, um, to me, any aroused group was a good group, and therefore I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan. That's Margaret Sanger saying that. The, um, she said, the door dims, and the figures parading around with banners illuminated with crosses. She said, but through the end, simple illustrations, um, I believe I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen so invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. Isn't that great? Considering it was the intellectual and scientific community and the United States government striving to be at the forefront of eugenics movement, it also should come as no surprise that Nazi Germany who you may want to recall now, got rid of the world's Jews or tried to as part of Hitler's quest to achieve the perfect race, learned everything that the Germans knew from us. Quote, I have studied with great interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction. By the way, several American states. Uh, all probability they would be of no value or interest to the racial stock. Here's a, a brag letter from Germany, from Adolf Hitler, saying, I just want you to know, I, I learned this from the United States. Let me show you another brag letter. This one from the leading U.S. Uh, eugenics group. I believe they were in California called the Human Betterment Foundation. They said, you'll be interested to know that your work has played a powerful part in shaping the opinions of a group of intellectuals, intellectuals who are behind Hitler in this epic-making program. Everywhere I sense that their opinions have been tremendously stimulated by American thought, and particularly by the work of the Human Betterment Foundation. I want you, my dear friend, to carry this thought with you for the rest of your life, that you really have jolted into action a great government of 60 million people. I wonder if those in California, the progressive movement, did carry that with them for the rest of their life. This Betterment Foundation, along with other eugenics groups, operated in a close-knit network, publishing racist eugenic newsletters and uh, pseudo-scientific journals such as Eugenical News and uh, Eugenics, and they, they also helped uh, with the propaganda for the Nazis. You see, they were proud that their idea was finally being implemented. So when somebody says, like Hillary Clinton, I'm a, I'm a proud early 20th century progressive, like Hillary Clinton said um, in the early days of her election campaign, this is who she's talking about, and you should know that. Now that's quite a charge to say progressives of the day are like the progressives, like these guys. Isn't it? To say they have anything in common is an outrage, unless they do have something in common. And I want to now take you to today and see if you see anything in common. The 20th century progressive. First thing, they deny the authority of God and they place themselves in the role of the grantor of rights. That comes from Nietzsche. They don't see value in all life. They think that they're better than you. They seek control of all things that are happening to and around you because they know better. Okay, so that's what a progressive does that believes in eugenics. That's what they believe. Let's see if we have anything in common. First, let's start with placing value on life. Well, you know that we've already, we're funding Planned Parenthood and everything else, which is Margaret Sanger. But what about this? This came out last week. Uh, this is from Salon. So what if abortion ends life? They published an article on abortion daring progressives to take the mask off and stop denying that it's life, that it's life inside the womb. The author, a progressive author, argued that it is life. So what? 
We all knew it. We've all known it for a very long time. We just haven't said it. I'd be happy to have an abortion because, she said, quote, all life is not equal. Okay, the next one uh, on the list that they have to have in common, if they're going to be like the early eugenicists, um, they have to have control. Well, progressives have already taken control of health care. On Friday, it was announced that sodas and candy will be gone from schools, but guess what's being made more available? Without your knowledge or your consent, yes, your kids will now have the morning after pill. Bloomberg bans soda and trans fats, but will hand out the abortion pill to our kids. Your kids can't do this, but they can do something else. Wow. Do they believe they're superior to you? Well, watch. This is what they found. The people in childhood who had the lower IQs wound up being more conservative in adulthood. I'm just saying it's a study. Taking I think Sarah Palin proved herself to be, I think she's proven herself to be profoundly stupid. Most conservatives are wildly stupid. <laughs> I think people have been reluctant to say Herman Cain is dumb and an idiot like Sarah Palin. We said it about her because they're afraid. People, oh, you're just saying that because you're racist. I'm not racist. I think he's dumb. <laughs> I think he's really dumb. He's he doesn't have the brains to be president. Wait, just a, a, a final question. Do you think Herman Cain can spell the word Iraq? Okay, intellectually superior. And remember, the president in his executive order wants to find out if conservatives are dangerous. Uh, he wants to find out which groups are dangerous. Um, we also showed you a study last week that came out and said that conservatives are born dangerous. So why the history lesson today? Well, it all goes back again to that Al Gore video, declaring an ideology um, that I haven't heard since the early 20th century, that what we believe is in our DNA. And while it's generally good to be different, it can get out of hand. Hmm. So finally, the mask is coming off of the progressive movement. I'll show you the uh, video and the repeat in history with one of the world's foremost experts on eugenics. Things that you must be aware of. Next. Edwin Black, he is the author of The War Against the Weak, a book that I have quoted so many times, I don't think I could even begin to count it. In fact, I believe much of that last monologue, at least the stuff on the progressives, I learned from him. Um, not necessarily in The War Against the Weak, but the first book that I read of his was IBM and the Holocaust. Um, welcome. How are you? Thank you for having me. Um, not much fun being the foremost expert on this topic, I'm guessing. Well, uh, it's something I have to live with because right. uh, if we don't understand the transgressions of the past, we are absolutely going to commit them again. Your, your parents survived the Holocaust? Yes, my uh, mother was uh, pushed out of a train on the way to Treblinka by her mother and uh, she was buried in a mass grave and my father came upon her uh, buried in the snow, pulled her leg out and they lived for two years in the forest, uh, kind of like the movie Defiant but without horses. Holy cow. And when I, uh, uh, in my career, um, I thought it was my duty, I was born in the United States, to not only tell what happened but why it happened. Okay, so let's start there. Let's, let's go with um because I saw this, and when I saw it, I saw it on Friday while I was on the radio show, and I immediately said to my producers, I said, please get Mr. Black on the phone and find out if he sees what I see in this. Let me play this clip, which will go over most people's heads, and they'll think, oh, no big deal. Watch the clip and tell me what it means. The scientists now know that there is in human nature a divide between what we sometimes call liberals and conservatives, and it gives an advantage, you can speculate, to the human species to have uh, some people who are temperamentally inclined 
to try to change the future and experiment with new things. And others who are temperamentally inclined to say, hey, wait a minute, not too fast. Let's make sure we don't uh, do anything rash here. And this divide is found in every country, every culture, every ethnicity. It's part of our human makeup. And when these natural tendencies are accentuated with political ideologies or for that matter religious factions mm -hmm. and the other divides that are sometimes used to, to, uh, for, for advantage, then it can get out of hand. What does that mean to you? Well, first, I'm very disappointed that Al Gore made these silly remarks not addressing any political point of view, but simply on the facts, he's dead wrong. On the history, he's completely wrong. The science is junk science, and the philosophy is at the base of the same philosophy that gave us eugenics in the United States, which sought to destroy 90% of our neighbors, eventually 10% at a time, beginning with uh, some 14 million people in the first years of the 20th century and then continuing to take off 10 percent of the time and ultimately resulted in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. That's not a broken line, that's not a jagged line, that's a, a, that's line. a, a direct line. Right. The factual history that it is the liberals who are the great innovators. Uh, Henry Ford, who was one of the greatest innovators in the 20th century, Thomas Edison, Patton, these men were ultra-conservative to a fault. They were some of the greatest innovators in the history of the world. I believe, however, Henry Ford was agreed with um, Hitler on the Jews, wanted to get rid of the Jews. Um, I think it was Henry Ford who inspired Hitler uh, in many ways. Uh, it was Henry Ford who gave Hitler the concept of the international Jewish conspiracy through the mass production and the printing and the publication of the Protocols of the Elders of, of Zion. Right. And therefore, it was no longer just about getting rid of the Jews in your midst, as Hitler originally wanted to do, but now it's he worldwide. it was... If you're going into Czechoslovakia, get rid of the Jews. If you're going into Poland, get rid of the Jews. So now it's not just territorial conquest. Okay. It's territorial conquest and get rid of this enemy. Okay. That's Henry Ford. All right. So now take me back to, because what I, what I got from um, Al Gore is, look, it's genetic. There's people that want to move us forward, and there's people that want to move us backwards. They want to, they want to hold off. And it's not just that there are, the, because those, as he says it with a laugh, though those things happen, you know, maybe we have to slow down from time to time. But what's really dangerous is when those people, he explains, are co-opted by religious or political organizations, because then those religious and political organizations are only using those stupid people to stop us from doing progress. This is politicized science. And this same politicized science that was used in the United States became a national biology, eugenics. Also became an instrument of terror in the Third Reich, where anyone who was deemed to be out of favor with the Third Reich was automatically declared to be an enemy of the state, and they found some eugenic problem in his DNA. Remember, under eugenics, you were not born into prostitution. Prostitution was born, born into, into you. you. Right. And so this is, is a horrible conjunction of junk science and politics. Once again, I like Al Gore for some of the things that he has done, and I'm extremely disappointed. <laughs> and when your staff sent this to me, I barely believed that he would say such a silly thing. You must remember that the 60,000 people who were sterilized in this country the unknown mil millions of never born, the hundreds of thousands who are condemned to live in incarceration camps called sanitariums, the many marriages that were voided, the unknown number of marriages that were, vo uh, that were never allowed 
to take place because of the criminalization of interracial marriage. All of these different things. This was all a series of laws and theories set into place by the elite of America, the progressives, the do-gooders, the liberals, the people who wanted to make the world a better place. The same people that brought us prohibition brought us this stuff. Actually, that's actually very c correct. Uh, there, there is one other thing that we were talking about, um, and I said to the audience to make sure that you pay attention to this, and you just mentioned it, um, the sterilization. Now in Oregon, and you couldn't believe it when we brought it up, right? That in Oregon now, you can, you're, if you're 15 years old, you can be sterilized without your parents' permission. I have studied the sterilization laws in all of the states and in many of the federal programs which are above the states. And I was very involved in the uh, efforts by uh, the North Carolina legislature uh, to recognize, apologize, mm -hmm. and uh, compensate for the uh, past transgressions, the genocidal transgressions mm -hmm. of a mass sterilization. I've known that Oregon was, was a holdout and still had some vestiges of sterilization. I granted the interview to the reporter who wrote that story, but when I looked through the details in, in greater nuance after your staff sent it mm -hmm. to me, I was absolutely amazed disappointed and I'm still having a hard time believing yes, that the federal government is going back to authorizing and funding and encouraging sterilization. It helps, it helps anybody who wants to be in control. It helps them with all kinds of problems if we just have people just sterilize themselves. Hang on just a second. Back in just a moment. <laughs> None of you are going to be happy to hear what I have to say. It's not good news. You're going to get angry. You're going to be shocked. We are talking about Nazi eugenics. This was Hitler's idea for a master race. But very few people are aware that the idea originated not in Nazi Germany, but in the United States, two to three decades before Hitler came to power. If you want a uh, history book that you have, uh, uh, history that you just won't learn any place else, get War Against the Weak. Um, let me take us from history to the future here. And if we have time, we'll come back to um, history. But we're seeing the, uh, I believe, um, that we are seeing the seeds that are very, very disturbing unless people wake up. We're seeing a, a loss of um, caring of, of life. We're seeing a loss of love for my neighbor and the people in my community. We're seeing a pitting against each other for political uh, purposes. Um, and we're seeing now something new that, um, that the world has never seen before, and that is... Um, the upgrade of humans, which most people don't know is coming very um, soon. Uh, and um, it's called the transhumanist movement. I've never heard of the transhumanist movement. Tell me about it. I first studied the transhumanist movement about 10 years ago when I first wrote War Against the Weak and learned that it was a society that was uh, trying to engineer their own uh, their own genetic future, uh, their own human design. It's self-enhanced and self-managed evolution. Quite clearly, it means that if an individual within the transhumanist movement has the technology and the desire and the money and the wherewithal to inject armadillo DNA into his own to get hard skin and become a big warrior mm -hmm. or perhaps a, a great singer or anything then they will go ahead and do that and they will see a divide within the world within society the gen rich or the gen ennobled those who are genetically superior and all those who are destined to serve them correct 
which is, of course, the Hitler motif. And now this is this sounds absolutely crazy, but um, Al Gore talks about it in his book. I was astonished to read that this morning. Yeah, um, and he also falsely gives the history of eugenics with lip service to some of Hitler's greatest allies in the United States, such as Harry Laughlin from the Carnegie Institution. Okay, so um, he talks about it, um, and it's not really armadillo skin. You say one of the leaders of this is a guy who's been on this program before, Ray Kurzweil. Well, he's one of the members, uh, the leaders of the transhumanist program. Yeah, that's what I mean. Um, and, and it's not an armadillo, it's, it's electronics. You're upgrading yourself, at least it's From anything. Armadillo skin is just one, right. one example. You might want to put a computer chip in your mind. Correct. You might want to sharpen your eyesight in a certain way. Anything that the individual feels is good for him to enhance his own evolution, it is personal selection and self-managed evolution. Okay. If it, was at the, if it was just somebody who was doing this themselves, it wouldn't necessarily be so disturbing um, as it is that this is um, something that leads to um, uh, corporations being involved. And I want, I want you to, I'm going to take a quick break and I want you to come back and tell me about what you see um, the next genocide uh, possibility would be. Okay. I am concerned about um, many things. I'm concerned about the lack of civility all the way to the lack of understanding of the value of life. And it is starting, the mask is starting to come off of some of these progressives that um, really don't understand the value of life. Um, and you believe that there is a, um, a new kind of um, genocide coming, um, and it involves corporate genocide what, what do you mean it's well genocide includes as one of its tenants uh, interference with reproduction on an organized basis to eliminate a group that's one of the legislated aspects of genocide okay. and so is the effort to el to eliminate the financial and um, other wherewithal of a, of, of a group that allows them to, sur to survive. I believe that now we are confronted with new genics, and it will no longer be a matter of national flags and racial dogma that determine who is enabled and who is persecuted and who is marginalized and no longer allowed to thrive and perhaps not even to exist. It will now be corporate worth. It will now be how important are we to the corporations that will once again control this entire arena. Right, and it's not the corporations um, by themselves, it's the, it's, the, it's the combining of the corporation with the government. Well, in the case of eugenics, it was the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Harriman Railroad Fortune that combined to create, invent, fund, and proliferate the junk science of eugenics. And the Rockefeller Foundation even helped finance hit, uh, Hitler's greatest Nazi doctors, including Atmar Vishore, whose assistant... From Long Island, right? W well, his, uh, uh, Vishore was communicating with Long I Island, but That's Vishore right. was a Nazi doctor, and his assistant was Josef Mengele, who went in to Auschwitz to continue the twin experiments that the Rockefeller Foundation had funded through his boss, Atmar Vashur. In Long Island, in Cold Spring Harbor, this was the outpost, the headquarters of eugenics in the United States. It was a nexus for eugenics worldwide, and it was the partnership with Nazi Germany that was threaded through the eugenics record office in the Carnegie Institution at Cold Spring Harbor. What's happening now is there is an effort to identify people genetically for what is believed to be their value to the corporations because they have the ability to and deny them a job, deny them insurance, deny them financing, deny them housing. Mm -hmm. And in England, this led to legislation known as the Anti-Discrimination Act to avoid uh, the so-called genetic uh, ghetto, which was passed unanimously in the United States by the Senate 
uh, and then held up for two years in the House through the lobbying efforts of the insurance companies. It's the insurance companies that will lead the way to Nugenics. Okay. Um, I, I'm... I'm uh, I, we, we, could, we could do a lot more um, here. I will just tell you this, that um, he is the guy who has the history key. Um, and you are going to see what he has written about happen again, and you're already beginning to see the foundations of it. Please do your homework on it now. It's whatever gives people power. These people, um, this is actually an original William Tyndale Bible, um, and all he wanted to do was be able to read it in his own native tongue. And so the church and state burned him to death because it took away their power. They burned people to death in the Inquisition because if you didn't submit to them, it would take away their power. The same thing with the people with the KKK. It took away their power. This is actually, this is uh, just such a spooky thing, even on a stupid mannequin. This is actually um, a woman's um, KKK outfit from the 1920s. Uh, originally owned by, I don't know, somebody, some famous KKK woman. I don't know. I, d I didn't know any famous ones existed, but it's extremely disturbing because it was owned by a woman. When the women of a society go awry, you're in deep, deep trouble. The KKK thought that they were superior, but it really wasn't superior as much as it was about power and they tried to wipe those out that they believed were inferior but where did that come from that idea of superiority had to be carefully taught before the violence of the KKK because the KKK happened after the Civil War there came this and this is a a, a dog tag this was a tag had to be worn. This was uh, number 1041 from Charleston. And this is a dog tag that had to be worn by um, a slave. And they were not to be caught uh, without it around their neck like a dog. How do you get to the KKK where you really believe you're superior? Well, make people into dogs first. But before people were made into dogs, and it was only one race, it was, ra it was uh, raged on, on really anybody, not just race. It was anyone poor, regardless of their color. In fact, many of the slaves in the early American colonies were white. They were called indentured servants because you'd be expected to be free after you served your time. And that went for both blacks and whites. And between 1630 and 1670, while they were burning people to the stake for this, here in America, slavery of both black and white was commonplace. And freed whites and freed Africans, as they were known then, um, would contract their own slaves, both black and white. When African Anthony Johnson was free, we have Darwin. And after we freed the slaves, Darwin came about. And he took hatred into a whole new theory. He was only part of it. Darwin's theory of evolution was gaining popularity, and he warned of the consequences of failing to selectively breed. He said, and I quote, if the various checks do not prevent the reckless, the vicious, and otherwise inferior members of society from an increasing at a quicker rate than a better class of men, the nation will retrograde. As has occurred too often in the history of the world, we must remember that progress is no invariable rule. So in other words, you're not guaranteed to move forward. Well, now we're breeding people like dogs. And Darwin's theories influenced many, including a guy over in Germany named Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche's most famous for declaring the death of God and believing the world had to be freed from the evils of Judeo-Christian morality. But that would beg the question, of course, if it's not God's morality, then who 
whose morality do we replace it with? He answered, quote, society as a great trustee of life, a great trustee of life, is responsible to life itself for every miscarried life. It also has to pay for such lives. Consequently, it ought to prevent them. In numerous cases, society ought to prevent uh, procreation. To this end, it may hold readiness without any regard to descent, or rank, or spirit. He was saying here that you could restrain people in any way, even deprive them of their freedom in certain circumstances, even castrate them. Well, you take Darwin, you have to help the species along, otherwise we'll go awry, and then Nietzsche, there is no God, and we have to, even if we take them and deprive them of their liberty and freedom, we have to do that, because there is no God. This was the trouble that brewed in the 20th century, and it eventually led to the uh, promotion of something called eugenics, Greek meaning good birth. And from 1912 to 1932, three international eugenic congresses took place. This is an original copy of a book called Eugenics. It's absolutely horrifying. The purpose of eugenics and these congresses was to investigate how they could improve the hu human genetic makeup. Which country... But tonight, we focus on yet another ugly piece of history that seems to be repeating itself once again. And it came to my intention last week when I watched this clip of Al Gore, which we will play here a little later on in the program. It's shocking, but only if you know history. And so that's what we're going to do. Tonight, we'll focus on one unfortunate common thread shared throughout human history, and it is hate and the attempt that hate eventually makes to wipe out massive sects of human population based on various forms of hate, um, fear, ignorance, whatever it is. We have such a long history, and I, when I say we, I don't mean you and me per se, I don't mean the United States of America, I mean humans. And that's what it seems we forget over and over and over again, that it's it's humans that have a hate problem. This, for instance, this is a document of real hate. This is, um, this is the document of the court proceedings, if you can call it that, of the Inquisition. This was for um, a man who uh, would not submit and uh, would, would not declare that uh, uh, he was uh, on the church's side or the king's side, if you will. He eventually did, after they made this case against him, he immediately then did submit, and this guy was lucky enough to live. But that's the Inquisition. The Inquisition where um, if you were deemed a heretic, you would be burned to death or you would be tortured. Um, and that's just one episode. The punishments were, quote, for the public good in order that uh, others may be terrified and weaned away from the evils that they might commit. It's interesting to me that um, the church and state, when combined, would burn people to death um, for not paying attention to God. And then later, the church and government would burn people to death for wanting to pay attention to God. The government doesn't matter. See, it's not the same hatred over and over again. Do you suppose was the first to undertake action? Of course. It's the progressive era. Under progressive president Teddy Roosevelt, he created the National Hereditary Commission, whose mission was to uh, encourage the increase of uh, families of good blood and discourage the vicious elements of the crossbred civilization. Oh. Sterilization laws cropped up 
In fact, the first one was passed in Indiana in 1907, where you could just grab a woman or a girl and sterilize her. It's horrible, right? You wouldn't want just girls sterilized, right? Remember that for later in the show. Others followed. The betterment of the uh, race. Um, in Yale, they had, a, um, they had a race to get to a better race, if you will. Um, and the whole thing was to um, get other Americans um, from, their, from their homes and pull them out, deprive them of the ability to have children if they were, you know, stupid or deemed um, wasteful people, and lock them away in institutions. These actions were likely emboldened because of the academic elite were behind the idea. And so they just knew better, right? The greatest minds in America, Yale, arguing that our national vitality depended on a productive citizen. And the best way to ensure that, of course, was through carefully controlled breeding. Well, you can't, you can't pick who should marry who and who should have children with whom. You just had to weed out those who shouldn't be breeding with anyone. Yale luminaries founded the, better, the Race Betterment Society, among other eugenics propaganda outlets, and eugenics became mainstream in the scientific community. It was a big deal. I'm going to show you a bulletin board at Yale that should um, scare the dickens out of you. This is from uh, Yale in the early 20th century. It says here, these are three, these three little circles there. I don't know if you can make them out or light bulbs. Um, the first light bulb says this, flash, uh, this light flashes every 16 seconds. Every 16 seconds a person is born in the United States. This light flashes every seven and a half minutes. Every seven and a half minutes a high grade person is born in the United States and will have the ability to do creative work to be fit for leadership. Only about 4% of all Americans come within this class. Then the top one says this light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, one hundred in 1635, he received 250 acres of land and he became the master of both black and white slaves or indentured servants. He's actually most famous for being the first owner, if you will, of a state-recognized African-American slave. There were no cameras back there, but uh, back then. But do we have the picture? Have we already showed it to you? The picture of the uh, of the owner. There he is. He's an African American himself. You see, the the idea is that hate knows no bounds, but it's always about power and control. All you have to do is believe that you are superior, some way or another. Race, intelligence. Progressive history t teaches us that our founders hated the Indians because they were all racist and they kicked the Indians off their land and stole it. Yet, countless Native Americans fought alongside Washington during the Revolutionary War. The real hatred of the Native Americans didn't come until much, much later. It didn't come until Andrew Jackson really started to um, uh, make it just very popular. He decided that the Indians were evil, and he implemented the Indian removal policy, which amounted nothing less than an ethnic cleansing of the Native American. This is a book um, called A Century of Dishonor that um, came out. It's a very rare copy because no one wanted to read it. No American wanted to see it, but um, I'm preserving it so it lasts. What, what happened? What happened to the people who wouldn't become Christians? What happened to the Christians who wouldn't sit down? What happened to the Native Americans that weren't good enough? What happened to the slaves? You see, Abraham Lincoln, when he wanted to free the slaves, he didn't argue that a man would be, um, uh, that a man who was black was um, superior. What he did was he argued that you have no right this is his thesis. He says it's not about black and white. It can really be about anything. He said, if A can prove that he may have the right to enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? This is his letter in his own handwriting. But the next paragraph goes on, but you mean that it's not color exactly? You mean that white are, whites are intellectually superior to blacks? 
then why can't someone who is intellectually superior to you enslave you? You see, the argument falls apart, and Abe Lincoln knew it. In the 1800s,